This will be 1930s part six. It's the last time I'll have time. Well, one I'll have time for. Uh, so we'll do what we can with it. There's one other thing I want to do that you just really can't skip over <clears throat> when you're looking into the Depression. And that's how it affected people. How did it affect the people who lived through it? Now, some people weren't affected much by it. Probably most people were to some degree or another. Um, <clears throat> now, this is especially in the hard-hit areas where where uh, unemployment was very high. Um, to begin with, uh, the unemployed men, let's just start with them. The culture at that time being quite a bit different from what it is today, <clears throat> it just was assumed by pretty much everybody that in a family there are gender-specific roles, and the man would have the job and go to work and uh, support the family, the wife would keep the house and help raise the kids. Now, <clears throat> a man's whole sense of identity and adequacy was bound up in his ability to provide for his family. That was a big deal. <clears throat> and when he loses his job, he's not worried. He'll find another one. He knows he's a good worker, but he can't. There aren't any jobs. Everybody's laying off. And eventually, he could become just worn down because uh, maybe just to make ends meet, his his wife is taking in ironing or laundry or something, his kids mowing somebody's lawn that are more fortunate. <clears throat> and uh, uh, it, it, it can break him psychologically because, as I say, it's, it, it, it's, if his wife has to work, that calls into question the adequacy of his efforts when there's nothing he can do. So... Uh, <clears throat> Not a large percentage, but it looks like a fairly large number of down and out men. Sometimes they just abandon their families and <clears throat> just go out and ride the rails, drifting around the country. There may have been as many as two million men and boys, and maybe some women with them, just drifting around the country. Sometimes they'd hear there was work in the Pacific Northwest or the West Coast, and they'd go out there and find either that that there really wasn't any work, or that they're going to be just ferociously exploited in, you know, agricultural labor such as that. Um, some railroad company, Missouri Pacific, I think, uh, was keeping track of how many uh, how many people were riding the freight trains, how many passengers the freight trains had, and it, it just zoomed up to a low six-figure number of uh, people just <coughs> riding the trains, and they may have just started looking the other way and let it go. Um, these, these men were often called hobos, and they would live in the shanty towns uh, called either hobo jungles or after the Hoover administration failed to get things back on track, it might be called Hoovervilles, usually outside of town. Um, just whatever kind of excuse for a dwelling they could pull together, um, scrounging for food. There are people who had been comfortable during the 20s. That hadn't even done anything wrong. Uh, the men had houses and jobs. And the bank closes. They don't have access to their funds. They, so they get their house foreclosed on. They become homeless. Can you imagine what a scar this is going to leave? The fact that during the 1920s, the acquisition, acquisition of material goods was hugely important. Status symbols. That proves that you're modern and up with the times and that you're a prosperous person. That goes away. Their families, maybe they still did have a house, but they would they they're just pinching pennies to survive. They would still spend beyond their means to keep up appearances. That was a big term at the time. <clears throat> okay. My father turned twenty in the year nineteen thirty one. Okay terrible time to be young. Now, he didn't get to go to college until after World War II, but the colleges are still there. Scholarships had hardly even been invented yet, unless you're an athlete. And uh, middle-class people, you know, they're still going to college. The colleges are cranking out graduates. Uh, some of them, many of them, prepared to enter what we call the learned professions, at least teachers, if not doctors, lawyers, accountants, and so forth. And for doctors, there always be sick people as long as you don't think they could actually pay you anything. Um, but for many of them, there, there were no job prospects at all. None at all. 
you just face blankness. So I, my dad was gone before I realized that he had told me virtually nothing about his life in a small town in central Texas during the 1930s. Now, he served in World War II, older than most of the soldiers. He was 30 when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Uh, he served in the 36th Infantry Division. That's a, a Texas National Guard unit that fought in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy. Got mauled, and he was in a medical unit. He wasn't a doctor, but he was in a medical unit. I can only imagine the horrors you must witness there. He didn't mind talking about that and where he went and the diseases he caught. He'd go on and on about that. He's intensely proud of it, as he should have been. The 30s, dead silence. His mother had died in 1930 when he was like 19. His father died in 1937. And um, all I knew was that he visited some relatives in southwestern Arkansas in 1937 and that he was in the Civilian Conservation Corps for a while. That's all. Also, I'm just barely old enough to remember hearing the grown-ups compare notes of how they fared during the Depression. Okay? I can remember hearing people say with pride in their voice, we didn't go hungry. If you could claim to have got through the Depression without going hungry, that's something you would hang on the wall. You would be proud of that. So, <laughs> uh, it was a very rough time, and it left its mark on people. And, you know, when, when the Depression ended, within two or three years, we've gone to the opposite extreme. World War II is going on. People on the home front, employment is, if you don't have a job, you're trying to avoid one. And uh, the economy was just hitting on all 16 cylinders. It was the opposite. But those people, they lived through the Depression, they got through the war. After the war's over, the United States, after a transition, heads off into just unprecedented, real solid prosperity, and those people were paying themselves back. They wanted the biggest house and the longest car with the tallest tail fins they could get their hands on, and then my generation comes along, and we didn't have to go through crap like that. People, people in my generation accused the older generation of being materialistic. Well, guess what? <laughs> Maybe they just had it coming. Okay. Um, there's more on that in the supplement. Now, in the little bit of time I've got left, I'm not going to make another uh, video. <clears throat> Herbert Hoover was president when all this broke loose. He was a perfect fit for the 1920s. He was a highly skilled administrator. President was only political office he ever held, and he's confronted almost immediately right out of the box with a with a with a crisis that would require the very highest degree of political skills and he just didn't have those so <clears throat> hoover did use federal authority after it took him a while to get the clue to start doing it he used federal authority more vigorously than any previous president political mythology notwithstanding he ends up being demonized and the problem is he entered office with high expectations since then, some presidents have been smart enough to kind of keep the expectations low so they look good, rather than high, where almost anything's going to make them look worse than expected. But Hoover was demonized. He was blamed personally for bringing this on. Uh, people, just, they couldn't believe a catastrophe like this could just happen by itself. There had to be a villain. There had to be uh, a lightning rod, and Hoover got to be the lightning rod. So. A shanty town was a Hooverville. An inverted empty pocket was a Hoover flag. And like an old newspaper you might huddle under on a cold night in a Hooverville try to keep warm. That's a Hoover blanket. You get the idea. So make sure you know what the Hoover what the, what the economic assumptions were. The two parties were pretty much two peas in a pod getting into this. Uh, things like uh, the huge mistake Congress made in the uh, Holly Smoot tariff, what that did, made things worse. What the uh, Federal Reserve didn't do and why, okay, if I had a, another video to spin here, and it's just because I have to do others for the other classes, don't know about that. The bonus march. Tragic situation in 1932. 
Okay. Hoover was defeated for re-election quite easily by Franklin D. Roosevelt that had Democrats looking at each other thinking, wait, what? Because uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, um, he would promise conservatives to balance the budget while promising liberals huge spending programs. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to tell about the guy, but he had this reassuring air, made people feel like they were safe and it was being taken care of. But long story short, neither the Hoover nor the Roosevelt administrations, New Deal and all, actually managed to get the economy back up to where it had been. That was done by World War II. So know what the New Deal was, Hoover's, I mean, uh, Roosevelt's program, and the second New Deal, which originated from Congress, the election of 1936, the Roosevelt recession. What three things caused the economy to relapse? Uh, well, what three things um, tainted Roosevelt's reputation? in 1937 and beyond, and why the economy slipped back down the slope, almost back down to uh, 1932 levels. And the, the, the long-term, like, uh, post-mortem on, on the Depression and on the New Deal, what did it do? We find that, uh, which is true of you know, starry-eyed government advocates then and now, there's very little that the government can do to help, there's almost nothing it can do to help everybody. It can only be selective and stir things down, help some by hurting others, and it's not proven that it really can manage anything other than screw things up. My personal view, government's power to screw things up greatly exceeds, exceeds its power to actually accomplish anything. So, um, I have uh, do well on exam three. Do you uh, shortly look for uh, probably an email announcement on that? Except if this is not fall of 2020, this just applies to fall 2020. Uh, and uh, have a nice, safe, restful holiday. As I used to tell my students, you know, get some rest. Um, don't eat too much. You know, right? Don't do anything I wouldn't enjoy. And by all means. Come back alive. And I tell people something at this point every time. There was a day long ago, about this time of year in 1994, where I sat at my desk in my office and signed my name to three student withdrawal slips, each of which said, deceased. Three of my students get wiped out in a really, really messy car wreck just north of Granbury in November 1994, had those kids survived to the present day, they'd be well into their 40s. So don't let that happen to you. Like I had a student come back from spring break a couple of years ago, a couple of weeks late, where you been? And his answer was, Mexican prisons are no joke. I bet they're not. Anyway, I'm rambling on. So uh, see you back after.